Hello, my name is Greg Mario Court. I am one of the full-time history instructors here at TCL. And what I'd like to do today is to give you some background information on our present governing system, the Constitution. So what I'd like to do right off the bat is to direct you to the map behind me. There's four of them here. The first one is from the year 1700. It basically shows the three main colonizers of Europe in North America. You've got the Spanish in brown, you've got the French in green, and you've got the English in orange. So then we move up to 1763. The French have basically been squeezed out, but you still have the Spanish and the English. Now for our purposes, it's this map right here that I'm going to go ahead and show you because this is what's going to count as far as when the Constitution was first developed. So in the year 1783, when the United States was officially recognized as independent country by the British, North America now has still a lot of brown, decent amount of orange, but this grayish area that is now part of the United States, various states and territories here. So my lead in now is this. The government system that we had in place before the United States even came into existence is something called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation meant that the United States was literally a confederacy, which means a league of states in which mutual agreement to create common action is in place. So, in a confederacy, you have a voluntary association, and this is the reason why we call our country the United States of America, because it started out as a confederacy with 13 of them. What I want to go over with you now is the main governing body of this new government that we have in place here right off the bat was the Confederation Congress. It had the following powers available to it. It could declare war, conduct foreign affairs, settle states uh, state disputes, create coinage, operate a post office, and control western lands. Now, it had the following main limitations, though. It could not directly tax any of its citizens and it needed constant state approval. So if the United States wanted to go to war, the Confederation Congress could declare it, but it wasn't official until nine of 13 states approved it. That's the minimum for anything to pass and be the law of the land. The Confederation Congress also had no trade regulation power. So if South Carolina was having a disagreement with Georgia, it couldn't step in and solve it. So basically what we have in place at this time is what we call legislative supremacy. That means a government dominated by groups of elected officials. For the Articles of Confederation, this means that the state assemblies have the bulk of the political power in the United States. So for anything to go through and be official nationally, it has to go through the states and it has to go through the state assemblies. So do you have governors in these states? Yes. They usually have weak powers. Do you have judges, the judicial branch? Yes. Again, they don't have near the power that the elected officials do. So here's what's going to happen. Throughout the American Revolution and after the British officially recognized the United States, which took place with the signing of the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the overall economy of this country was not good. So the United States struggled mightily in this important area, which meant it encouraged outbreaks of political unrest. So to try and remedy this, by the late 1780s, we're going to see the creation of a national constitutional convention that was held in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, during the late spring and early summer of 1787. So the concern here is, will this new country make it with this kind of government in place and a terrible economy? So the original goal of the Constitutional Convention was to revise and strengthen the Articles of Confederation. 
Delegates from all the states except Rhode Island ultimately attended and participated in it. I do want to tell you now that if I was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, I had three things in common with other fellow delegates. And that would be we all were pro-democracy. We all believed that we needed to have a republic in place as a government. We all were anti-legislative supremacy. In other words, the other branches of government need to have legitimate power along with elected officials. And we're all skeptical about the nature of the use of political power, giving it too much to one individual or group. The delegates in Philadelphia during this time period split into two groups. The first was led by James Madison of Virginia. And I want to give you some main features of what his group ultimately was calling for. First of all, they said, let's do away with the Articles of Confederation. It's beyond repair. Secondly, they wanted a system of checks and balances. Three main branches of government, but each with the ability to counteract the other. So that if one branch of the government is going too far, the other two or one of them at least could step in. Then the idea that the federal government is supreme, that all decisions passed by the federal government are automatically binding on the states. No going through those assemblies anymore. And then finally, instead of one Congress, which you had for the Confederation set up, you'll have a bicameral one. And so you'll have two branches, two houses for Congress. Now, how would you choose who serves in Congress? According to James Madison and his group, they want to use something called proportional representation, which means that you take a census and you get the number of uh, representatives in the Congress according to how big your population is. So the more people you have, the more representatives you get. The last thing about this I'll bring up is a single executive. So one person in charge of the executive branch. Well, there's another group who had their own ideas of what they wanted to see. They rallied around a man named William Patterson of New Jersey. And there are a couple main features I want to bring out about this group. They felt that you had to have a strong Supreme Court. So you have to make sure this branch okay, has a legitimate amount of power too. And they wanted a bicameral con a Congress, but on equal representation. So in other words, it doesn't matter how many people are in a state, you all get the same number of representatives. So in the end, Elements of both plans were passed by the, Confederate, by, by the Constitutional Congress. The main thing they had to compromise on, and they did compromise on a lot of other issues, but the main thing I'll bring up now is the bicameral Congress. So they agreed that the House of Representatives would have proportional representation. So you'd have members according to how many people are in your state, okay, in the country as a whole. But the Senate would have equal representation. So you only get the same number of people there regardless of how big your population is. In the end, these delegates, the majority of them, okay, some did come and go okay, or not sign in on the final document, but the majority of them did finish their work in mid-September of 1787. That meant they had to turn it over to the Confederation Congress for approval, which they did, and that was done immediately. But the big confirmation had to come from the states. The states, nine of the 13, had to approve this, or it was not official. So all that work that was done in Philadelphia would go for naught. It took till the following August of 1788 for 11 of 13 states to approve it all except Rhode Island and North Carolina. At that point, that was considered enough to go ahead. You had the more than nine, so it's officially approved. And the first federal elections in the United States of America under the Constitution were held in the fall of 1788. So that's when the first president was elected, not by popular vote, but through the Electoral College, which, was, which is a compromise, another compromise that was made to get this document through. And you had your first members of the House and Senate. So I'm going to close here by saying that on a regular basis, 
We've been having federal elections since this time. Now, not long after the Constitution was put in place, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, were created. And since that time, we've also had several adjustments through the various amendments to our Constitution. So what I want to do at this point is to encourage any eligible adult who is not registered to vote to do so. And once you do so, to get out and make sure that you cast your ballot. This is the way that we've been doing things for well over 200 years now. So make sure that you make your vote, your presence as a citizen count. It might not seem important, you as an individual, but when you start adding up people and you have to do it one by one, it's extremely important. So on that note, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Constitution Day.